one thing we discussed was the idea of a national configuration um, so that you could analyze the data from all the hospitals at once. So I'll just repeat that because I believe I did cover it last time. Um, as I said, a lot of times all, if you have 10 labs, a lot of times they have identical configurations uh, because very often you create one for hospital one and then people just copy it multiple times. If you do that, then you have 10 identical copies. In which case, it doesn't matter which configuration you use because they're all the same. But of course, over time, the different configurations often develop a life of their own. Um, uh, and then, uh, let's, oh, that's right. I, and I did download the new software. Let me just put the new software in. Uh, you know, we're always in the process of making changes and updates. So I'm going to, I downloaded it earlier today. I just didn't have time to install it. So downloads, this is the new software I downloaded this morning. And uh, I'm just wondering why it would, uh, <laughs> usually doesn't give me that message. Okay. More info. John, I did the same yesterday. I, I had the same message and also I had problems installing it. So hopefully you have better luck. Okay, well, I did just have to, so we have, um, Oh, it's already saying it's already yeah. installed. Okay, well, okay, good. That's so it might be related to, to distribute Hunet. We have a, a secure digital certificate, it's valid for three years. It expired last week and we purchased a new one. So, this is the very first time that we are using the new one. Uh, so there must be some issue there of configuration. And good, so all right, so I will not show you, I will not do the new software there. Um, and I have one from now Thursday. No, not well, anyway, I have a recent one. Okay, so let me do that. Um, let me go back to Hunet. Let me move the go to meeting controls out of the way again so I can actually access my screen. Okay, I, I'm going to click on cancel. I'm going to go to file. So we looked at this feature called create a lab from a data file, and that's where we started to end up with compatibility issues with the DBase and the SQL Lite. Let's see whether that's resolved on my computer. Uh, so let me choose Ethiopia, and I'm gonna choose Ethiopia All Laboratories, and I will call this All. And then I just choose examples of, you know, I choose this one from NRL, I choose this one from a different hospital, I choose this one from another hospital, I choose this one from another hospital. So each of these comes from a different facility with different antibiotics and different data fields. I click OK. And then I, um, it's gonna look, it's, now I'm gonna click on OK. It's gonna look at the contents of each of those four. Uh, okay, so the, one, the reason I updated this, I wanted this feature, but apparently I think he did this feature before the last update. So, but I, I can still describe it. So basically in that feature, uh, and I think it works if I just do DBase files. So let me try that again, but using the DBase options. So let me just say Ethiopia, Ethiopia, all hospitals, all. And this time I will only choose uh, the older DBase files, which is what you have. Uh, there, let's see, I have to move these controls out of the way. All files. And this is this is one. This is a DBase file, oh, basically anything that doesn't end in SQLite. So all of these are different data files from different groups. In fact, even this one is combined from different groups. So I click on OK, and hopefully this will work. Good. OK, and it says there are too many fields. So there is a maximum of 255. That's just because I chose a, complete, a bunch of completely diverse ones from UCAST and CLSI. So it's not an error, it just means soon it's warning you, it'll go with the first 255, which for most people is more than plenty. Most people have like 100 or so, even less than that. Okay, so what it's doing is it's analyzing the contents, the data field names, the antibiotic lists, the dropdown lists, and it's creating a configuration that has all of that. So this new configuration can be utilized to analyze any of the facilities. So it's finished, I say yes. And here I have my antibiotics on the right. And these antibiotics are from every single laboratory. Here at the top, you see the disdiffusion, 
If I go down further, I see the MIC. If I go down further, I see E-test. And so because it's, so it's 207 antibiotic tests. That's why we're so close to, we're just slightly over 255 total fields. Uh, we have the antibiotics, and then we have the non-antibiotic fields, like first name, last name, et cetera. And then if I go to location, this is every location encountered anywhere in any of these databases. Data fields, it has every database, every isolate, every data field found in any of the databases, including these food ones, these animal ones, these locally defined ones that somebody made for their own local purposes. So I'm going to say save. And now when I go back, I have Ethiopia All Hospitals. So this would be very valuable for you so that you can feel comfortable. Uh, what you've been doing previously, I guess, is analyze Hospital 1 with Hospital 1 configuration. Analyze Hospital 2 data with Hospital 2 configuration. Analyze Hospital 3 data with Hospital 3 configuration. But using this one, you can analyze all of the data from any of the hospitals using one configuration. That's more con convenient. You can keep the breakpoints up to date because it's, it's just the one configuration. And more importantly, you can analyze all 10 hospitals at once without being afraid of losing missing antibiotics. As I explained the other time, if I am analyzing data from hospital two with the, if I analyze, if I open hospital one and I analyze data from hospital two, it will only find things that they have in common. So if hospital two does some antibiotics that hospital one doesn't test, then I will miss those if I analyze hospital two using hospital one configuration. But if I use Ethiopia all, it has all labs, all antibiotics, all locations. So I, I, I'll just leave it at that. Are there any questions on how to create a national configuration? Yeah, maybe uh, I have one question. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's really good uh, to have a national configuration because uh, while you are analyzing uh, hospital one, you are expected to open uh, its own laboratory. So, uh, so you can analyze the whole data by using this national configuration. My question for you is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the national configuration will contain all the possible fields uh, that are found in all hospitals, uh, but sometimes the variable names or the field names uh, might be different, but they have the same information. So in that case, uh, the national configuration will treat these variables in a different field, right? So how can you manage these things? I'm just sending a reminder to Rodney, um, uh, just in case he's, he, he, he has the invite. So if he's not on his practice, he's just busy. Okay, um, good. So that's a very good question. So I'm with the in. Hey, John, I'm with the in. Oh, is that Rodney? Yes, this is Rodney. I'm with the in. I'm with the in. Oh, good, good, good. No, uh, good. Thank you, thank you. I did not double check the participant list. Great. Um, okay, great. It's an excellent question. So it is true that if I have data fields from hospital one, hospital two, hospital three, when you merge them together, HUNET will merge columns that have the same name. So hospital one calls it patient ID, hospital two calls it patient ID, hospital four calls it patient ID, and everything will merge perfectly. However, if somebody decides to delete the HUNET patient ID standard field and put something else called Ethiopian national ID, then HUNET will merge, HUNET will include the new column in the new file, but it will not merge the column contents because HUNET doesn't realize it's the same thing. So, you know, you'll have, so, so if five hospitals call it patient ID, but one hospital calls it national ID, you'll, the new, the new configuration will have two different files, two different fields. Let me go to that. I'm, I'm going to Ethiopia All Hospitals, Modify Lab, Data Fields, and you can see here at the top all of the normal standard HUNET fields, which I recommend people do not change. I mean, they can change the length. Like first name is 20 characters. I don't care if you change the length. HUNET will just simply choose the longest length. 
Uh, but you know, all these standard fields, you shouldn't change the name. Here at the bottom, this one says patient state. This one says response to treatment. This one, I don't even know what CHEDO is. It's something that, I think this is actually from a Vietnam group I was working with, uh, GHI, I forget what that project was. Um, so HUNA will include everything in the configuration, but it will not merge the data files together. So then if you go to HUNA data analysis, let's me do an, let me do an example. I'm gonna click on save, well, and I'm gonna to go to data analysis, analysis type, isolate listing and summary. I'm just gonna do the list this time. Organisms, let me say all, and data files, let me choose all. And you know, I'll just choose some of those exact same files, the combined, not the Excel test, you know, so I'm getting data from a variety of systems. Okay, okay. Begin analysis. Uh, but I'm gonna, uh, now this is that DBase issue. Uh, so we're in the process of my, my computer, oh, let, let's see if I can get that to go to. As you can tell, we're having a lot of issues with this DBase stuff, which is why it's so important for us to have the SQL light. Um, I'm just going to reinstall the users 2090, uh, the users JS90. And downloads. And Microsoft Access, where's the Access Engine? Access Engine, so I'm just going to reinstall that. Usually reinstalling the Access Engine 64, now it's confused because of the 64 and 32 bit. All right, well, that's a pain in the neck. Okay. Um, okay, so instead, what I'm going to do this time around is because this portion does work with the SQLite. So I'm going to just put SQLite here. So I'm just going to choose a variety of files from different systems, and I'm choosing OK, and I'm choosing OK, begin analysis. So it's analyzing all the data from these different facilities. But if there are two columns that are similar, Hunet is not smart enough to know they're similar. So what you see here, a variety of different things from different columns. Here's your market category, patient ID, those X long, the diagnosis. So if they have called the same, if they have to call the same content, the same field, the same field name, there's no problem. Hunet simply merges the contents together. But as you're pointing out, if one hospital calls it identification number and a different hospital calls it HCEDO, WhoNet will retain them, but they are in separate columns. Um, also with the antibiotics, if some of them have imipenem uh, disc and imipenem MIC, if some of them make a mistake and put imipenem 5, imipenem 10, WhoNet will reliably capture all of those fields as separate fields, it's not gonna to try to merge them together. So basically, as long as people keep to the standards for the things that you care about nationally, there won't be a problem. It's only things like, you know, these user-defined fields, the, the GHI, CHU column, this one here, um, those things are might be very different between hospitals, and that's okay. It means that I don't care about it at the national level. They care about it locally. They wanna know the name of the doctor. So things at the national level that I care about, I want very well standardized. If I don't care about it, you know, I, I can just ignore it. Those don't have to be standardized. Do those comments help? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but uh, what is the difference between combining the different hospitals data and uh, having, uh, analyzing, uh, each hospital using the national configuration. So, you know, we can convert all the hospitals data, then we can analyze uh, the merged data. Uh, and also another option is to create a new configuration to the national level. Uh, then we can analyze each hospital using this configuration. So uh, what is the difference between them? There are a number of related issues that we're discussing here under data files. I can analyze as many files as I want. Yeah. So the files themselves are not being combined. The files are staying the way they were. 
you know, this file is the way it is now, and after running the analysis, it will still be the way it is. So in this way, I can analyze data from many files. The files will not be combined, but their data will be combined in the statistics and in the analysis. So if I just choose a whole lot of files here, I am not combining the files, but I am combining their data into the analysis. Yeah. So there is no requirement at all to physically combine these files together. Okay. If you physically want to combine the files together, you can. I didn't show that today. I've shown it previously. There is an option here called Combine, Export, or Encrypt Data. So in, when I do it this way, and I say all files, and I just choose a bunch of the files here, uh, I don't want to choose any big ones. I don't want this to be slow. Uh, that's not. That's fine. And I just chose some things that are not D-based files. That's fine. Okay. Good. And um, good. That's fine. And I click OK. Good. So all of these files, I'm now going to be combined into Ethiopia. over it's just easier to deal with one file rather than multiple years so is that distinction clear like here there's no requirement ever to use this feature called combine but it can be convenient if you're just getting too many files and you just want to combine them together you know for example what i do when i'm doing a research project is i will have one file per hospital per year so if i have 10 hospitals 10 years i have 100 files but if I'm doing a publication about those 100 files, I do find it personally convenient to combine all 100 files into one very large file. I don't have to do that, but it just means when I'm doing my analysis, I don't have to select 100 files. I just choose one very large one. After the publication is done, I have two choices. I can delete that file because it was really just temporary. Or I'll zip it up and I'll just keep it as an archival thing and I'll connect it to the publication for later convenience if I ever have to redo anything. So is it now clear the distinction between combining the files physically using this feature to make one large file versus this one, data analysis, where we're not combining the files, but we are combining their contents into the analysis. Is that distinction clear between those two combines? One is a real combine, we're combining the files. The other one, we're not combining the files, we're just combining the contents uh, in the analysis. That's clear? Yeah. Now this other feature that I mentioned, create a lab from a data file, it is actually not really combining anything. Uh, it's not combining any of the, the data rows. So it's not, it's not combining the files, but it is looking at the headings. So if there are 10 different hospitals, it looks at the headings for hospital one, headings for hospital two, headings for each of the hospitals. And it says this hospital has 10 antibiotics. This hospital is 20 antibiotics. This
configuration, the combined and the national configuration are one and the same, or is there a difference? Well, okay. So, so, so okay. Well, uh, um, so, so, okay. I'm back at the main screen. File open. I'm now opening file zero one. I'm opening file zero one. When I go to data analysis and I choose the data from all of these different facilities, it will only analyze the antibiotics of hospital one. So even though the files are being combined, it is only looking at the data fields and the antibiotics of hospital one. So here, I don't want to, if I'm analyzing data from all Ethiopia, I do not want to open hospital zero one because it will only give me the antibiotics of hospital zero one. I would like to use the, when I'm analyzing all of Ethiopia, I want to use Ethiopia all hospitals, but this I had to create. And the way to create it is basically we're scanning it. We use this feature called create a lab from a data file to scan the contents of multiple hospitals in order to create this national config. Now that I have analyzed the national, now that I've prepared a national configuration, then I can use this configuration. I open this configuration, then I go to data analysis, and then I choose any of the hospitals, the data from any of the hospitals. Is that still unclear? The, these are three very different uses. They overlap in you know the general ideas. So so first of all, combine is never needed. There's no need, there's no reason you ever have to combine data. You combine data only out That's of condition. You know, you have 12 files, you, you've just prepared of one file. So the reason for combine is simply to combine things for convenience. In data yeah. analysis, you often want to combine data from multiple facilities, but it will only anal it will only combine the facilities with regards to the open lab. If the open lab is zero one, it will only analyze the zero one data. The, I'm sorry, the zero one mm -hmm. fields and the zero one antibiotics. But if I'm analyzing all of Ethiopia, I don't want to do that with hospital zero one. I want to do that with Ethiopia all. And the way that I create Ethiopia all is I scan the data from multiple facilities. Okay. So this one is about creating a national configuration. It's not combining the data. It's only combining the mm -hmm. data definitions. Once I've combined mm -hmm. the definitions, I now have my new configuration. Now that I have my new configuration, I can utilize that to analyze the data from any of the facilities. Okay, it's more about method than when you're uh, doing the first um, national configuration. You only have to create the national configuration once, and then from then on, you can do everything with that national okay. configuration. Yeah. Now that okay. I've looked, now that I've created the national configuration, I could choose data from hospital one, mm -hmm. or I could just choose the data from hospital ten. So using the national con configuration, I can do the national analyses, but I can also do the individual facility analyses. You know, if I'm interested in data from hospital one. I can open the configuration from hospital one, or I can just use the national configuration. Either one of those is fine. The advantage of using the all is that I can choose hospital one or hospital two or hospital three, or all three of them at the same time. Whereas if I choose hospital one, I really should focus only on hospital one. That's clear, thank you. As long as we're discussing this, uh, there's this feature here called Copy Lab. Let me make a copy, and let me call this Ethiopia. I'll call this All Hospitals Important Stuff or um, <laughs> Minimal or something like that. Let me call this um, All Minimal. So now I have two identical configurations. One is all hospitals. That's the one I got from scanning all the files. And now I have all hospitals minimal. At the present time, these are identical. There's no difference between them except for the name. Why would I want to do that? I'll show you why. I'm going to go to modify lab. I'm going to go to data fields. 
and I can say I, you know, I, I, I'm going to click again on modified list. I'm moving now my go to media control so I can actually see what I'm doing. And here you see the thing from HO10. I don't care about that. I'm going to remove it. Diagnosis. I'm going to get rid of it because maybe only one hospital did that. Response to treatment, patient state. I'm just going to get rid of stuff that's not part of my national protocol, just out of convenience. You know, I, I, if I'm doing some tables, I don't want the table to be too long because it has a lot of things I don't care about. For example, I'm going to click OK. I'm going to do the same for the antibiotics. OK, antibiotics. You know, for example, here, like this one, amoxicillin ND25 is an invalid test. <laughs> Celicide does not have any disk diffusion breakpoints for this. So one of the laboratories is doing it, but it's not a valid test. Therefore, I'm going to delete it. So I'm deleting it because it's invalid. Or carbenicillin, that's a very old drug. I don't really care about it. Uh, and you know, maybe one of the hospitals has data. So this is allowing me to, to like piperacillin, is no longer really used. Um, so basically, your laboratories maybe test 50 different antibiotics, but maybe there are 30 that you've all agreed on nationally. So the though the reason I'm doing this minimal is really just out of convenience. Like if I'm doing, I mean, I'll just show you an example. I'm doing the minimal now, data analysis, analysis type. Let me do this summary. Let me do the summary by laboratory. Okay. Let me do E. coli. Uh, let me. Well, let me do a different one. Let me do the uh, isolate listing and summary. Um, well, let me try the antibiotics and see how that does. Because uh, I, I didn't pay attention to which files I was selecting. Um, let me make sure at least there's some real data here. Um, yeah. No, let's do. Test. Let's make sure some of that. So this one is real data. See, a lot of these files are basically empty. Um, you know, whenever you see the file size is 16, that's basically just an empty file. Okay, begin analysis. So I've done this analysis, and it is not showing me all of the antibiotics because I have deleted some of the antibiotics. Well, I, I, I don't think I saved it. I, I, you see here, here, here you see the piperacillin. But you see, only hospital two tests it. Hospital one doesn't test it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to go back to my minimal configuration. Antibiotics. I'm going to go to that piperacillin, and this time I'm really going to delete it. Last time I said I was, but I didn't actually save it. And I'm just going to delete a bunch of things here, deleting a bunch of stuff. Delete the MIC stuff, etc. Okay, save. Data analysis, data analysis. Let me repeat the same analysis. Let me do this by summary. Let me do this by laboratory. Let me do this for E. coli. Let me choose this for two of my test data. This is this one and this one. I click OK, click and begin analysis. So basically, I've just filtered it. Now, when I analyze the data, you don't see any piperacillin because I deleted it. Let me go copy graph. Let me do copy table. Let me go to Excel. So now I have it in Excel and I have cleaned this up a bit. This is not polluted with a lot of antibiotics I don't care about. If you have a network of 20 hospitals and one of the hospitals that's taking cycling, I mean, it's great for them, but it just kind of messes up my national thing. I end up with a lot of missing columns. So, um, uh, continue. So, so is that clear? This all hospitals is everything, every antibiotic, every field, everything, everything. But some of those things I really don't care about, and it just messes up my output. Because if I want to share this at the national level, I don't want to share the national level statistics for piperacillin if only one hospital tests it. So, just a way to pre-filter the data to the things I care about. You know, instead of calling it minimal, I called it minimal. You know, I can call it, you know, I could call this, you know, national protocol, you know, just so it's only the subset of things that you have all agreed to test and publish and analyze, deleting all the stuff that really is not so important or well standardized or complete at the national level. Is that clear that the advantages of all hospital with everything, everything versus all hospitals where you just kind of prune it to that subset of things that you really do care about?
I hope that's clear. Uh, if it is clear, then there are no questions. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So that's a bit about the national configuration. Okay. Now, in terms of data cleaning, we talked a bit about this earlier. I'm now going to click on all labs, national protocol, and I'm going to go to my quick analysis, and I'm going to choose my patient, statistics, patient and sample statistics, data files, and let me just choose. Let me just choose those two hospitals that I just chose. Well, but they, I promise they both have the same name. That doesn't help. So let me choose both of those uh, there. And let me just choose some other ones here. I think the Agisar should be here. Uh, let me just choose. I'm just trying to find some real data. Agisar, yes, that's real. And let me choose Glass. That's real. And, and I can also choose the NRL. NRL. So this is real. Okay. Okay. And so we've already done this. I did this last time, but last time I only chose a single laboratory. Now I'm going to click on Begin Analysis as a reminder. If I click on Edit, it's going to do each of these macros in sequence, lab by month, sex by lab, age by lab, location by lab, et cetera. See. I did this last week, but I did not choose multiple facilities. Okay, great. So here you can see I now have four labs. As I mentioned, two of the two of the files were both from the hospital TST. So this is a combination of those two different rows. We have data from 001, 01, as we've already discussed. Those should really be combined. Last time we did review how to clean that. And SKH is simply a different hospital. Uh, and then here I can see the distribution. So in terms of data cleaning, I can see their distributions by month. So for test, it's from January 95. SKH, the data is missing, and your data is some other, it was a later time period. Um, that's because it's several years later. Um, so this allows me to see if any data are missing. And then you go back to the hospital, and you tell them you're missing January. Or you used to have 100 a month, and now you have five for last month. So that's one aspect of data cleaning. Here you can see male and female. You can see that. Hospital 01 and Hospital 01, these first two have age and gender listed. SKH and TST don't, so the data is missing from there. So you can go to those hospitals and say, I see you do not enter male and female. Is it possible for you to do this in the future? So you're again providing incremental comments so they can improve this over time. So that's male and female. I will click on continue. This is by age group. And again, Hospital 001, Hospital 1 have ages. The last two columns don't, so it's just it's missing from those files. And you, yeah, just a little nudge them. Can you do this next year? This is now about the location. So here you see dental, dialysis, emergency department. It's very specific for that hospital. Gynecology, intensive, uh, L&D, maternity, spelled a bunch of different ways. So that's also another data cleaning issue. Like, they have MMSW. That's probably, uh, I don't know what exactly, but it's like surgical ward male. Or, so they're not consistent. So this is part of data cleaning. Can you please be more consistent in the future? Maybe A, B, and C. Maybe that's the bed. I don't know. And that's from hospital one or hospital two. In fact, that you can tell. Those codes come from hospital SKH because you see that column is filled in. If I go down further, these locations are from hospital TST. Um, and these are nice and clean. And also Hospital 01, we discussed you don't enter that, you entered into department. So it's it's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the same way the other people have done it. So it just makes it harder to compare the data between facilities. When I click on continue, it now does it by location type. So this is much more standardized. I can see Hospital 001 and SKH don't enter that, which is unfortunate. We don't know if it's an inpatient or an outpatient. I think you put that information into department. So it's not that it's not there, but it's there in a way different from the other hospitals. Meaning it's just less, it's more awkward to integrate the data. So we'd like to standardize where people put the information so we can facilitate, you know, how this is, you know, the, the analysis. Um, good. And I click on continue. There's now specimen type. So SKH, most common location, most common specimen is urine. Test, hospital, also urine. Hospital 001, most common is blood, followed by urine. And I'll click on continue. So that's just a part of recognizing different issues that different hospitals may have. 
Okay, I mentioned about the 01001. I will review what we discussed last week. Last week, how do we fix that? We can go to, there are different ways to do it. One way is I simply open the file. So I'm going to do NRL, and there it is. I click on View Database, and here I see the data. And here you can see some 001s, but if I keep on going down somewhere, you see the zero one. So you see those two different things. So as a reminder of what we did last time, how can we fix this? Well, if we want to fix them one at a time, we can click on Edit Isolate, and we make the change on this screen. Or I can simply click on Edit Table, and I can say that, let me go back to the top of this list. Well, okay. These zero ones, this should be, uh, oh, that's right. Adam already fixed this. Right now I can't edit this because it's a hidden field, but we can edit these other ones, E. coli, E. coli, et cetera. Uh, the reason we cannot configure lab is if I click on edit isolate, I'm sorry, edit isolate. Uh -huh. there. The lab column does not appear on the screen. So because it doesn't appear on this screen, we can't edit it here. Adam fixed that, so there's no reason you couldn't fix it here. So in, in short, to edit isolates one at a time, click on edit isolate. To edit the table, you just click edit the table. This inability to edit 001 was fixed last week, and I just have to update it. Okay, and um, good. So that's when you're doing just minor fixing. Like, let me go to the vancomycin. You know, if you find some vancomycin resistant, you find that isolate, and you click on edit, and then you just fix that one isolate. You could either delete it. If you're not sure, you could just go ahead and delete it if you're not sure what the result is. If you retested it, then you could confirm it to the correct value. So, so it, uh, let's see, what else can I do there? I'm going to go back to View Database. I'm going to click on the column. One of the most common errors in the specimen dates. I'm going to click on specimen date once. So here you see these data are from January 1st, 2019. I click on specimen date again, and they run on December 30th, 2019. This is nice and clean. These are all data from the year 2019. But a lot of times you find typing mistakes, maybe from December 2018, from just from, you know, just before the year started, or people just mistype. They'll put 1963 because they just put the, the year of birth rather than the year of the specimen or they'll put the year 2030 because they just are typing, they're just typing the wrong date. Um, so you can easily see that. I just sort by anything else, sort by lab. You see a lot of different institutions here. So that's interesting. These are all different. This is all the same laboratory. This is laboratory uh, SQLite. Well, uh, no, actually it's your data. This is your NRL and this is the name of the institution. I didn't even realize that was here. I'm gonna show you how we can also utilize that. Let me go to continue. Let me go to exit, data analysis, analysis type. First, I'm going to do this. It's a related data cleaning. I'm going to do a summary. Okay. All. Okay. Data files. I think that was NRL. Good. Let me choose that. Okay. Right now, it is going to do organism by date. So here I can see the distribution, Asinita vector Bamani, Lawafi, you see the distribution, like, you know, I, I, mean, think, I think we even found this outbreak last time, Burkle dairy Cetacea, okay? This is organism by month. I'm going to change that and put organism by laboratory. I don't think that's going to be helpful because we only have two labs, lab 01 and 001, which is not interesting because it's the same lab. So that's organism by lab. But now what I can do is organism by institution. Oh, I put this in the wrong place. Organism in the rows, institution in the columns. So here I can see organisms are still in the rows, but the, each column is the different institution. So let me go on E. coli. So E. coli is mostly hospital ABT, hospital OT, I don't know if that's a real hospital, and then hospital OTH, which I guess is other, 
Um, so you do need to be consistent. Is it OT? Is it OPH? Or maybe they are different. I don't know. ALH. So this is so we talked about data cleaning, but data cleaning is always related to epidemiology. Do the numbers make sense to you? Uh, you know, if you had a if you had a ton of things under unknown data, if it simply said unknown, it means that the person simply forgot to type the data. Uh, uh, or if hospital ABT is everybody else. Stones or something. I go to the patient's name and I look for the person's name or values. Same thing for organism. If I go to organism, this is a list of every single organism in this database. So that's one value of filters. The second value is I can click on select all because I don't want to see everything. I only want to see the E. coli. And now I only see the E. coli. And you notice a few things. You notice I only see the E. coli. You notice the icon changed. This is an active filter. The icon is a little bit different. 
Now let me just make that a little bit larger so it's easier to see. So I just changed the icon, meaning that the filter is on. The other thing that happened, I just have to move my book to meeting control, is that the lines turn blue, the row numbers turn blue. We have row number one, row number four, row number eight, row number nine. So you can see how valuable filters are. You know, if I just wanted to find the, the CRE, I can just go to the imipenum column. And I just look for the small zone diameters, like six millimeters is complete resistance. So Excel is valuable if you know Excel from doing a lot of these simple manipulations. We cannot edit the data in Excel. Excel will not do that with a DBase or SQLite file, but Excel is very valuable for visualizing your data. So we want to take some of the, oh, I, and I forgot to show you the search and replace. Well, let me do that. Let me, let me reopen that file, which I just closed. Uh -huh. File open, WHO tests. So let you, you see here that it's called cardiac surgery, um, but you know, maybe I would like, you would like I, the problem is I, I, I was going to tell, I'll, get, I'll do this example. You just need to make sure there's enough enough space. I'm going to replace C surge with cardiac surgery, which is more obvious. So I'm going to say replace or replace all. So we've replaced all of it. Do you have the two options? Replace them one at a time, replace all, or you can just do find next. So some of these features that are extremely valuable in Excel, we will start to put them into Hunet, filter, find, replace, replace once, replace all. So some of your cleaning, like the 001 issue, I would suggest to wait until we have that replace feature. Okay. Are there other specific examples that you would like to discuss about data cleaning? As I said, for advanced data cleaning, I often do that with Excel, I'm sorry, with Microsoft Access. Like if, the, if somebody put in me pen, um, uh, I think, uh, well, let me say that one that I know. If somebody put, for example, uh, Ceftriax on 30, that is correct. And somebody else put Ceftriax on 10, that is not correct. How do we fix that? Well, actually, for that one, actually, I can tell you how to do that. If I go to data entry, I can say modify data file structure. Why, why not? Uh, well, it depends. Do you have Excel 2003 or later than that? Yeah, later. Sort of, I know that you don't have Excel 2003. So Hunet uses a very old fashioned data structure called DBase. Okay. If I click, uh, it, let, I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna try clicking on save. File, save. Excel tells you we can no longer save dbase files to save your changes click ok and save in the latest format 
they're requiring that you update this to Excel. So here you see the list of all of the options, Excel, CSV, CSV web, yeah. Unicode, the XML. Mm -hmm. and DBase is no longer on this list. Uh -huh. So DBase was on this list in Excel 2003. And then uh, DBase is not a Microsoft product. And every year, Excel makes it harder. Microsoft makes it harder and harder to use DBase files. We are very glad that Excel is still able to read a DBase file. I don't know why they allow you to read it, but they don't allow you to save it. I am glad you are at least allowed to read it. I commonly recommend that people use Excel for visualizing and seeing um, their DBase files, uh, but Excel no longer supports you to save it back to a DBase. Okay, and you can't save it to the CSV and-, and no, 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 no. That's, not, that's not a problem, you know, so I can save it to Excel. I mean, so it's not as if I cannot save the changes. I have saved the changes, but the saved changes are in the Excel file and Hunet doesn't understand Excel. <laughs> So yeah, I could save it to CSV, but then who know, then it's not a Hunet file and Hunet would no longer understand it. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, uh, I never even thought of that, of actually using CSV as an option for Hunet as a data structure. It's not a modern structure, which is why uh, we never supported it, but DBase is for 20 years and now the problems, you know, every, you know, we, we had a few problems with DBase in the last few years, and then it started to grow in February. And the last two months, we've just been having a lot of issues. I do think it's because that Microsoft did some automatic update. Uh, there, there is even a web page. Um, I, I don't think I can easily find it. But in January, uh, it's on the Microsoft web page. Uh, Microsoft DAO temporarily removed removed support. Um, and I need something. If I, a lot of you may not know this, uh, I, I don't. I only want things from this year. So I'm going to say any time. I'm going to say you know from the past year. So you don't have to do the whole thing. Um, troubleshooting, debase, remove, remove. Um, no, I don't find it. But Microsoft in January made a statement. We are no longer going to support the DAO technology, which is what we've been using for 20 years for DBase, which is why we had to rush. We, we were planning on transforming it at some point, but this year we really had to rush it because Microsoft unexpectedly just pulled the, uh, you know, pulled the carpet from under our legs. And that's why you see these little things coming up, especially the most common features are working, but some of these things like create a lab from a data file is not so common, but we did fix it last week but I was unable to install it right now. And this issue about modify a lab, I'm sorry, modify a data file structure is also not a common feature. So we've been prioritizing, of course, the common features that people are utilizing. But we're getting there. So we want everything to work exactly as it's supposed to. In fact, these training courses I'm doing have been very valuable to me because when I do my testing, I don't test everything. During these workshops, I do a lot more testing. So a lot of times after these workshops, I immediately call Adam and say these issues identified during the call. And most of the time you could fix it the same day or the next day. Okay. Next question or next issue? Uh, maybe another question? Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes uh, pathogens uh, may be tested against the unrecommended uh, drugs. So my question for you is, is there any mechanism to identify uh, specifically in the Hunet dataset, these kind of errors? Yeah, there are different ways to do that. Uh, sure, L let me close this. Uh, I just, regarding, regarding, we talked about many ways to identify problems, and then we start talking about cleaning problems. I just want to summarize them here. Edit isolate in data entry. Edit table in data entry. Modify data file structure. For example, if the problem is the name of the field or antibiotic disc potency, there is, um, and then there are more advanced things like access and ask John for assistance. So, and then you can do this on your own, but the, whenever you, you may not, for a lot of things, you will not need that. But if you do need it, the first time we can just do it together. So, um, yeah, I think those. Those are the main strategies that I was going over. Okay, great. Uh, oh, or also, 
I, I forgot about this one. Um, edit in access. Okay. Uh, edit. Okay. Certain in access. Edit individual data points. Edit data file structure. Or merge columns together, including search and replace. Uh, so it's very easy. So uh, you cannot edit data files with Excel, but you can edit them with Access. So if you link or import your data to Access, you can do a lot of very simple things. Just edit, just like we were doing in Excel. Very simple. Anybody with any knowledge of Access can easily do that. Edit data file structure. Most except most people also know how to do that. Merge columns together is more complicated. You need to know how to do what's called an update query. Uh, so these are additional strategies, and we're trying to get more and more of these features built inside of Hunet to decrease the need to edit them in some other software. And a lot of it, like search and replace, would already take care of a lot of people's needs. Okay, great. That's all I have to say about that. Now, regarding your new question, yes, you were asking about invalid data. Um, good. Let me go to something like, let me just go to data entry. Let me go to e -Cult. Let me go to Steph Aureus. Okay. So let's say, let's go for something like, okay. So here on the right side of the screen, you see the breakpoints? I'm case in 15 to 16 is intermediate. I'm hitting enter, 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 and you always see the breakpoints. Okay. But this one you don't. You see it's Cephapim Zitabactam. I don't know who in the world pay. I've never heard of that. It's a brand new drug, and there are no breakpoints. So whenever there are no breakpoints, that is a sign that it's not a valid test. It might be a it might not be a valid test because it, there are not breakpoints yet, and this is probably an example of that. It might uh, like there might be valid QC ranges, so people might start testing it for QC before CLSI has made breakpoints. So one reason there are no breakpoints is there are no breakpoints yet. Or let me see if I can find Nova Biasen. Is that on the screen? No, I don't see Nova Biasen. Well, okay, I'm just going to keep, keep on hitting enter. So this one, no breakpoints. Cephotaxime clogulanic acid. This is not for antibiotic interpretation. This is for confirming ESPL. So th th it's not an antibiotic that has breakpoints. Next, next, next. Cephperome. That no longer has breakpoints or no CLSI breakpoints. Similar explanation, Ceftoberpro. So, Hunet is going to tell you. Let, let, let me just chose the other example I wanted to do, the WHO test hospital. And if I chose, if I choose, if I do the same thing with the WHO test hospital, go to Stephorius. And Nova Bias, and I did notice it on the list, but let me go to the complete list, all antibiotics. Nova Bias, and so let me go. Meslicillin, yes. Minocyclin, yes. I, I'm looking here at the right. I'm looking to see their breakpoints. Minocyclin, yes. Nitrofurantoin, yes. Nerfloxacin, yes. Novabiosin, no. There were breakpoints for this drug 30 years ago, and then Celesi said it's not a, it's not a, it's not a reproducible, reliable test. So every time you see no breakpoints, that is a clue that it is not a valid test. What happens if I type, for example, 30 millimeters? Hunet says the interpretation is question mark. So that's one way to know something is not valid is you get, you get the interpretation as question mark. I'm gonna to go to vancomycin and I'm gonna type six millimeters. That also gets a question mark. Vancomycin in a general sense is a valid test, but it is not a valid disk test for Staph aureus. You know, it was a valid test in the 1990s, but then they realized it just wasn't reliable. You had a lot of resistant strains that incorrectly were being called susceptible. So in this case, vancomycin, it's not that it's not a valid test in a general sense, but it's not a valid test for, it's not a valid test for, um, you know, Staph aureus. You know, similarly, if I put E. coli, you know, um, and if I go back to all antibiotics and I put vancomycin, mm -hmm. you know, so, all, so every time you see that question mark, 
Mm. It's, it's, it's a sign that it's not a valid test. That's one way you would know, simply on the data entry screen. Let mm. me go to data analysis. And I'm going to do percent RIS for Staph aureus. And let me choose the sample database. OK, OK, oh, and I, did, I forgot to. Let me choose the database again. OK, begin. And question mark. So here, look at this, the vancomycin. Zero, and this is confusing to people. It's 0% sensitive, which sounds great. <laughs> But then it's 0% intermediate, it's also 0% sensitive. It is 100% question mark. And if you look at the breakpoints, there are no breakpoints. So that's a second clue. It's the same thing, but it's on a different screen. So if you see there are no breakpoints, that is a clue that, there, that this is not a valid test. Okay, good. I'll now show you a third way. I'm going to exit, I'm going to go to file, modify, uh, I'm going to go to quick analysis. Go to quick analysis. I'm going to choose the HUNET standard report, which we saw previously. HUNET standard report. Let me choose that one month of data. Let me click OK. Let me begin the analysis. We saw this earlier about data field completeness, organisms, antibiotic results. You see, section A, section G is called laboratory configuration. And here it's telling you. No breakpoints have been defined for the following antibiotics. The most common reasons for this is there are no approved breakpoints for this antibiotic, meaning it's an invalid drug, or somebody chose the incorrect disk potency. It's supposed to be ampicillin 10 micrograms. If they put ampicillin 20 micrograms, they would also get these question marks. So there's a three rotation equals question mark. Invalid test. If you interpret your national protocol, this should go with the national protocol. If you notice that you know the national protocol says 30 and they're doing 10, you know, then that's also a sign. You could just check manually in that direction because you'd have to be an expert. I personally, top of my head, think, but there are certain patterns. Most of the cephalosporins are 30. So sometimes you'll notice, like, uh, like most of the quinolones are five, most of the macro. Archaeology 15. So sometimes you'll just happen to notice that somebody somebody just chose a wrong dispotence here. But you can only do this if you know what the correct number the correct is potency in five, but there are experts who really know what they're doing, who have other responsibilities, who might decide to choose something invalid, but they already, they know, they're experts, they know what they're doing. So I don't want to suppress the ability to find these other quote unquote invalid tests, but I do want to give the option, the user to say the short list or the long list. The short list would be the valid ones and the long list would be every possibility. So this will be, so here on the right, because I've been doing this, you see I have, three different Cipros. Every time, let me just highlight those three. Let me just put this in alphabetical order. So another sign that there's a problem is whenever you see the same antibiotic more than once. Uh, so, uh, by, so here I see disdiffusion four different times. Uh, sometimes that's correct, like ampicillin, there are two different valid ones. But whenever I see the same antibiotic more than once, I want to ask myself, is that a mistake or is that true? Okay, I hope that answers that question. In short, anytime there are no breakpoints, that's a sign this is an invalid test. And there are different ways to know that the breakpoint is invalid. Data entry, you'll see a question mark. Data analysis, you'll see a question mark. The HUNET standard <laughs> report will tell you there are no breakpoints. Yeah, maybe, John. 
Hello. Yes. Uh, you know, once upon a time, uh, we found uh, a problem like uh, they are testing uh, ampicillin for Klebsiella pneumoniae. You know, Klebsiella pneumoniae is intrinsically uh, resistant to ampicillin. So, uh, ampicillin, uh, it has a breakpoint uh, if you see it in the unit. So, that kind of uh, issues. Uh, may come to us so how can we handle this kind of sure sure what you were just describing is not in is, is there's, there's no problem and i will explain why but before doing that you see how i i did this um i'm going to open the ephi laboratory i'm going to click this is the one that you sent to me so i'm going to yep. click on modify lab antibiotics and i'm just going to take a quick look here Oh, and I accidentally clicked on cancel. I accidentally removed it before I meant to. Uh, modify lab. So you asked me about invalid antibiotics. Even I already have a clue. Off the top of my mind, I'm looking. So here you see azithromycin twice. The 15 is valid, but the 30 is not valid. Like, I know which one is valid. You may not know, but the fact that it's there twice is a flag. And so the 30 is invalid. I could simply remove it, but I don't know if there are any data there. Is that, if that column, if, if so let me even open up this file. This is, this is related to data cleaning. Let me open up that file. Let me click on view database. Oh, I, I must have chosen, I, sorry, I chose an empty, I chose the wrong file, data entry, which is the real, this is the real data. Remember, I, I just opened the wrong one. View database. And here, if I go over to the right, you're going to see that this drug appears twice. So here you see azithromycin 15 and azithromycin 30. This is also a very good aspect of, of data cleaning. Does this column have data? Let me click on this once. This column has data. Let me click on this other one. This column has four results. So what I would like to do to clean this up is edit the table. Six, 25, 24, 23. Does that make sense? I'm just moving it over. Okay. Uh, they have 15, they have 30. My guess is they do not have a disk of 30 micrograms. I don't even think they sell them. So, so sometimes people test the wrong drug I can't do anything about that. They tested the wrong drug. Sometimes they tested the right drug, but they incorrectly configured it in HUNAT. My guess is the laboratory tested the 15, but somebody accidentally chose the 30. Yes, sir. They entered four results. So this is a nice example of data cleaning. I just simply, I just simply moved it over to the right column. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So now that I've done that, I don't actually have to delete this column. This column is empty. So there's no need to delete it. It's just going to be ignored. But if you wanted to clean things up, yes, you could go ahead and delete the column as well to really clean it up. So now if I click on continue, save changes, yes, and exit, and I go to file, and I go to modify laboratory, antibiotics. So the call, I still have it on the list. I have azithromycin and azithromycin 15 and 30. I can remove the 30 with no bad consequences. The column is empty. Um, I did not actually just delete the column, but Hunet's not going to look for it. Hunet only looks for things on this list. So let me go down further. The cefepime zidobactam, I don't know if you actually have that disc. It's a brand new antibiotic. Um, these are actually wonderful new drugs, uh, but they're still in development. There are no breakpoints. Um, you see here, also look here, it says ND blank. Blank means there are no, there's no disc potency, meaning Hunet doesn't know what dispotency they are working on. So that's another clue. If you see there's no dispotency and you're doing distribution, there's obviously a mistake. Every disk has a potency. Let me go down further to see if I notice other things of the similar nature. Yeah, just a comment. Nobody tests carbenicillin anymore. It's a very old drug. Cefiroxime axotil, people no longer test. They just test cefiroxime. Um, uh, I think Doripenem, I think it's been removed from the market. I'm not sure of that. I think it was and then it wasn't. I'm not sure. Uh, here we have two genomycins, but that's correct. Genomycin 10 is the normal one for most bacteria. Genomycin high is the uh, is the one for Enterococcus. Linezolid, Merpenem, Pip, 
Piperacillin by itself, nobody tests that anymore. It's just too old. Uh, vancomycin, and here it's twice, but that's okay. This is the vancomycin disc. You can tell because it has the letter D, and it also says disc at the bottom. And this is vancomycin MIC. That's fine. I mean, these are just two different tests. Um, good. So that's another way. You just simply look at the list. You need a bit more knowledge, but you do this enough. You know, you sort of look for things that just don't make sense. The same drug is there multiple times. The dispotency is missing. It's some drug you've never, ever heard of that you know nobody is really testing. Okay, that was my further comment because I did want to do this. I want to do some example, which was not only my data. I did want to use some of yours. So this was a good example for that. So regarding this issue about CLSI, and we just have, uh, you know, 13 more minutes. So I'm just watching the time. Oh, no, we don't. We have, an, we have 40 minutes. That's right. We go till 930. Okay, good. Let me go to the internet. And this is just a good opportunity to talk about the CLSI document as a resource. And where's my Google Chrome? It's always moving because I've got too many icons. So CLSI free. I'm just doing a Google search, a web search for CLSI free. And I bring up free resources from CLSI. They do not make everything available for free, but they do make some of the key documents for free. M100 is routine bacteriology. M60 is yeast, the fungi. M23 is not for you. That's for people making breakpoints. You're not making breakpoints and you're not making QC ranges. M23S is the supplement. VET08 is a free document that is routine veterinary bacteria. Uh, there's also the documents that are not free. M45 is fastidious bacteria or rare bacteria like bioterrorism. Uh, M61 is for mold, human for mold. VET06 is for fastidious veterinary. VET03, VET04 are for aquatic animals, such as fish or shrimp or shellfish or lobsters. So we're going to go to the M100. That's the basic human one. Upper right hand corner, I click on click here to use guest access. And you see, I have these three free human documents. If had I clicked on the veterinary, it would have shown me the veterinary documents. M23 is for making breakpoints, making QC ranges. That's only for the experts. M60 is for the yeast. And M100 is for the human routine bacteria. Let me open that up. Wait, wait. and you do, so you do not need a login, no money, no password. This document is free. On the left, it says TOC, table of contents. And let's jump down immediately to table 2A. Well, OK, at the top, very valuable overview of changes from last year. So if people do not have the money to buy this document every year, they can look at it. And even if you do have the money, you still want to just know what the changes are. So if I click on overview of changes, this just summarizes. They replaced the word infection control with the word infection prevention. They replaced coagulase negative staph with the word other staphylococci. So that's nomenclature changes. And then if I go down further, eventually they changed table one. Table one is what do they recommend for testing? Table two are the breakpoints. So table two, uh, clarify added, colistin MIC. It, it's either added breakpoint, deleted breakpoint, comment about the breakpoint, clarification about the breakpoint. So I'm going back to the TOC, the table of contents. So the overview of change is very valuable. And then table 1A is what they recommend for testing. That's another way to know what they should be testing. Table 1A, in a general sense, is what CLSA recommends to the world. Nobody does exactly this. <laughs> this is just a general guide. They say, like, group A is always test, always report. Group B is always test, selectively report. Like in the United States, we have antimicrobial stewardship. You know, if you have a simple outpatient urine infection sensitive to 15 drugs, don't tell doctor all 15. Just tell the doctor the first few, the cheap oral drugs, first line drugs we want the doctor to choose from. On the other hand, if it's an ICU patient, if it's multi resistant, if I'm doing this for epidemiology, I want to see everything. So group A is a general recommendation, always test, always report. Group B, always test, selectively report, including some extremely new drugs like meropenem vaberbactam. That's valuable for the CRE, so these are new combinations. 
Group C is selectively test. Don't bother testing these always. Just test them if you feel it's appropriate. Second line, if you have personal interest. And group U are urine drugs. So here at the top, you see table, uh, let me do that again. Table 1A, this is Enterobacterialis, Pseudomonas, Staph, and Enterococcus, continued here with the non-fermenters, Acinetobacter, Burkholderius, Dinotrophomonas, other non-Enterobacterialis, followed by Table 1B. Well, Table 1B, I have to go back to my table of contents, Table 1B is what CLSI recommends for testing for the fastidious organisms, Haemophilus, Neisseria, strep pneumonia, or any, the other strep. That's group A. Group A is always test, always report. Group B, always test, selectively report. Group C, selectively test. And group D, ur group U, urine, but these are not urine pathogens. I'll go back to table of contents. I go to table 1C. Table 1C is what they recommend for testing for the anaerobes. And a lot of you do not test anaerobes. So these are for gram negative, gram positives. So these are general recommendations for what labs could be testing. And I recommend you do not use this list as is. This is a list is not appropriate for anybody. The concept is relevant. You choose the drugs that you feel are relevant. And a lot of people, especially if you're testing a limited number of agents, you always test and always report. You do not have to do selective tests, selective reporting. We do that just to kind of steer doctors to the cheaper drugs. Let me go back to the table of contents. Let me now go to table 2A. I'm giving you a roundabout answer to your question, but this is a different education. This is also, these are also valuable details. So table 2A, I'm gonna, you mentioned about Clepsiella and Ampicillin. So this table is for Enterobacterialis, which is the same as Enterobacteriaceae, which is family genus, you know, a kingdom, a family order. One is family, one is order. So this table is for Enterobacterialis, such as uh, E. coli and Klebsiella. So here you see the breakpoints for ampicillin. So there are no exceptions. All enterobacterialis have the same breakpoints, including Klebsiella pneumonia. Uh, so, so it is valid to test Klebsiella pneumonia for ampicillin. The expectation is the result is probably going to be resistant, but it might not be. That's why we have the breakpoints. As long as I'm on the screen, you can see results of ampicillin can be used to predict results for amoxicillin. You do not see amoxicillin anywhere on this list with the breakpoint. There is amoxicillin clavulanic acid, but that's different. That's amoxicillin plus something else. So amoxicillin by CLSI is not a valid disc diffusion test. Instead, test the ampicillin, and whatever you get for the ampicillin, just tell the doctor. If the doctor asks him what the amoxicillin result is, just tell him the ampicillin result because it's a proxy. It's a substitute. So in answer to your question, if you test Clebsiella pneumonia and the, the zone diameter is 30, then the report is sensitive. It's, it's unusual, but it is sensitive. There is another table here. Let me go to another table here called intrinsic resistance. It's one of the appendices. So here you see appendix B called intrinsic resistance. This is natural resistance. So what they define, let's see. Uh, I was hoping they would say some, some specific words, but they don't. But let's look at Klebsiella pneumonia. So Klebsiella pneumonia, let, let, let me get the column heading. So Klebsiella pneumonia is intrinsically resistant to ampicillin and intrinsically resistant to ticarcillin. Uh, whereas, well, that's not the unexpected here. What is interesting, I did not know this. Well, Klebsiella aerogenes used to be Enterobacter aerogenes. So Klebsiella aerogenes is intrinsically resistant to augmentin but it's not intrinsic, but Klebsiella pneumonia is not. So this is a very valuable table. What CLSI does not say is they do not say automatically change the interpretation. They're using this as a guide to quality control. So what happens inside of HUNAT? Let me go to HUNAT. Well, I think I had HUNAT open already. So, okay, let me just say save and let me go to entry and new data file and replace, good, okay. Let me go to E. coli and let me put Ampicillin 30. No comment, completely normal. 
let me click clip shield and let me um delete that let me click clip shield and ammonia and let me type ampicillin 30 now and you get what's called a low priority alert susceptible isolates are rare so several isolates are rare check check for a possible laboratory error maybe it is not ampicillin sensitive maybe somebody mismeasured it or maybe they measured the wrong disc or maybe they put the wrong disc or maybe it is sensitive but maybe it's not clepsial and ammonia maybe the identification was wrong so clsi does not tell you to change the interpretation they tell you please double check your work and double check your answer to make sure there's not a mistake what you can do here is you can manually change it to resistant if you're not safe, if you don't feel comfortable, I would not feel comfortable telling the doctor that the clepsilin pneumonia was ampicillin sensitive unless I really checked it and double checked it and double checked it because it, the clepsilin pneumonia is not 100% resistant, but it is about 95, 98% resistant. So if, if I have clepsilin pneumonia ampicillin sensitive, I would retest it. If I do not have the ability to retest it or in the short time, I might immediately tell the doctor resistant because it's probably resistant. So the reason when it does not change the interpretation is that CLSI officially does not tell us to change the interpretation. So that's why there's not a mistake in HUNET. We are simply following CLSI recommendations and CLSI says, yes, this is a potential quality control issue, but CLSI does not say to change the interpretation. Sometimes they do. There are other examples where they say to change the interpretation. For example, I'm now going to put Staphylococcus aureus, and I'm now going to say, I'm going to say 30 for everything. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Just as a reminder, the vancomycin has a question mark because it's not a valid test. Just reminding you of what we talked about a little while ago. Now I'm going to change the suffoxetin disc to six millimeters. So right now you see S everywhere. As soon as I change the letter at 30 millimeters to six millimeters, several of the drugs have changed to R. The oxycillin is now R and the penicillin is now R. Well, not several, they're only. So basically the beta-lactams have changed to resistant. So CLSI has a recommendation. If this is AC, if this is an MRSA, just go ahead and change these other things to resistant ignoring the zone diameter, just ignore the zone diameter. CLSA does not say to do that for Clepsiella and ampicillin. They do say to do that for confirmed MRSA. So does that answer your question? Exactly, thank you. Let me show you something using the ICID alerts. Let me go mm -hmm. to data analysis, analysis type, yeah, and yeah. ICID alerts. Can learn. Yes, is there a question? Okay, I'm going no. to ask, yes? Yeah. Mm. Okay, so uh, isolate alerts. I'm going to, so HUNET has a number of nice isolate alerts. I'm going to click on options. HUNET has about 190 isolate alerts, categorized into high, medium, and low priority, categorized into important species, important resistance, and quality control, plus a few other things. In answer to your question, I don't want to, I want to see all of the alerts. I, right now, I do not want to see, I, right now I only want to see the quality control alerts. So, I, if, so for the microbiologist, epidemiologist, infection control staff, maybe pharmacy, uh, they would like to see the important species and the important resistance, very valuable. MRSA, VRE, um, imipenem, vibrio cholera. So for those people, they want to see important species and important resistance. But into your answer on quality, which is a value to the national data managers and to the microbiologists, right now I'm only interested in the quality control alerts. I'll put all three, high, medium, and low priority alerts. And let me select OK. Let me select organisms and say all organisms. I can say data files and let me choose the Ethiopia data. No, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. This one here. Okay, and begin analysis. HUNET is showing me, this is not showing me all of the isolates. 
it is, if you look at the top of the list, this is wonderful. You only have 58 isolates out of the entire database. Only 58 isolates had a quality control concern. And, for, and here they are. And the red does not mean it's an error. The error means that the red means it might be an error. It might be true, but it might be an error. And let me go over to the right and you'll see a comment of why that is there. Uh, let me just find, let me make this column a bit wider. And let me make this column a bit wider. Okay. So here you see Enterococcus faecalis. So Enterococcus faecalis is, uh, where, where is it? Ampicillin. Enterococcus faecium is usually ampicillin resistant, but Enterococcus faecalis is usually ampicillin susceptible. So it's just basically susceptible isolates are rare. Um, or where's another example? You know, like Pseudomonas, you know, sensitive. So here we have Pseudomonas. Let me go back to some of the reds. Um, okay. So these Pseudomonas are piperacillin sensitive, but it's usually resistant. Uh, some of these rules I want to adjust, some of the rules I disagree with, but so all of these are basically, okay, here's another one. Staphylococcus tested by distiffusion. Distiffusion is not recommended for oxycillin. It should be the suffoxetin disc. So there are different kinds of quality control results here. Um, or for here in bacteriaceae, you see discordant results. Let me just, I'm gonna highlight the row beneath it so I can see the red. So let me, where's my red? Where's my red? I'm looking for the immunoglycosides. So here you see that the amicacin is resistant. Amicacin resistant, but gentamicin sensitive. Gentamicin resistant, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Amicacin resistant, gentamicin sensitive is not common. Amicacin is much newer than gentamicin. It's much more expensive than gentamicin. Around the world, it is very rare. It does exist. So it's not as if it's impossible, but it's relatively rare. So HUNED is, again, that's a kind of alert. It's called discordant results. It's just the aminoglycoside results usually agree with each other, but if they don't agree with each other, they don't agree with each other in a good way, in an expected way. Amicacin sensitive, genomycin resistant is common. Amicacin resistant, genomycin sensitive is not common. So uh, somewhere on here, I don't know about in your database, but in my database, um, I do have that example about Klebsiella ampicillin sensitive. I don't know if you have any examples like that. So I'm looking, no, it just goes in alphabetical order. Um, so here we have Klebsiella uh, ozanii, which is augmentin resistant, but piperacillin sensitive. See, that doesn't really make sense. If it's resistant to amoxicillin fibulin acid, it should also be resistant to piperacillin. So that gets a, an alert like that. The, the red shows me precisely exactly these issues of just unexpected results that may or may not be mistakes. Click on continue, and it will give me a summary. So the most common, so here we have a lot of low priority alerts. These are really just basic education that microbiologists should, should know on their own. They really should not need HUNET to find these things. Um, but it is good for educating new staff. Or if you're the national data manager, you're busy people, you know, it's nice to have a nice simple way. And here it's also separated by lab. So you can see that lab 01 has these quality issues. Laboratory 001, which is the same lab, has these issues. So you can see which quality control issues do each of the different laboratories have. Invalid tests, rare resistance, discordant results. So then you can focus in and say that some of these rare results might be true. Like, and personally, I'm not an expert. I know that Acinetobacter baumani is usually um, is usually resistant to, to quinolones. And here there was one isolate where it was quinolone sensitive. That doesn't mean it's a mistake. It's just pointing out for you, it's rare. Uh, and it's important. I mean, it, it's nice that it's sensitive, but the doctor has a sick patient with them with Acinetobacter. I don't want the doctor to give the ciprofloxacin unless if I've double checked my work. You know, we have what are called minor errors and major errors and very major errors. A major, an example of a major error is that the patient has a sensitive strain. Uh, let, let's take the example of ciprofloxacin. A, a major error is the patient's strain is sensitive, but the laboratory said the strain was resistant. 
this is bad because the doctor could have used quinolones, but they didn't use the quinolone. They didn't use the cipro because you told the doctor it was resistant. That's a major error because there was a lost opportunity. You could have used cipro, but you didn't. That's a major error. There's something even worse than a major error, which is a very major error. The very major error is the patient has a resistant strain, but the laboratory said it was sensitive. And then the laboratory, then the doctor says, oh, this, the bacteria is sensitive to Cipro. Let me give the patient Cipro. This is very dangerous because you've given the patient an antibiotic that is not going to work. Um, and this is whenever you see like Klebsiella pneumonia, if you tell the doctor Klebsiella pneumonia ampicillin sensitive, that could be dangerous because the bacteria, it might really be resistant and the lab made a mistake. Um, so that's a very major error because the patient may get a wrong drug. The major error, the patient's not going to get a wrong drug but you could have used a cheaper drug that could have worked but you know you didn't because you thought it was resistant okay, other questions uh, i have one other comment about the cupcell pneumonia ampicillin sensitive it is possible it is this is a chromosomal it's a beta lactamase chromosomal class a enzyme that causes the ampicillin resistance but that enzyme can be lost the gene can be lost or the inducer can be lost. So there are Klebsiella pneumonia that indeed are ampicillin sensitive. It is relatively rare. But even in that case, I still wouldn't want to use it because maybe the laboratory did make a mistake or because we only test the, the bacteria overnight. You know, in, a, in an 18 hour incubation, you know, the bacteria appears to be ampicillin sensitive and that may be true. But if the patient's going to be treated with ampicillin for three or four or five days, the bacteria might become resistant a few days later, especially if the gene is present but not being produced because it's just an inactive gene. But after two or three days, by selective pressure, the gene may turn itself on again. So th these are some therapy issues where intrinsic it's resistance is very valuable. If it's intrinsically resistant but the lab's is sensitive, you still probably really want to avoid it and not give it to the not tell the doctor to give it to the patient. I do want to make I do want to make a change in Hunet to even help this further to protect patient care. Hunet has this area. Well, if I go to data analysis, Hunet has these things called expert rules, options. Use expert interpretations. For example, if it is MRSA but penicillin sensitive, it isn't. Change the penicillin result to resistant. So Hunet already does change the interpretations for a few things. If I click on file, modify laboratory, antibiotics, breakpoints, expert interpretation rules. So all of you are familiar with this screen. I hope you're familiar with this screen about where you do the breakpoints, but we've never really discussed this option here called the expert rules. Hunet only has a small number of rules. In fact, these two rules are no longer recommended. These were CLSI rule that they no longer recommend. Um, if you have an MRSA, it is resistant to the other beta-lactams. If you have Haemophilus influenza or inducible clindamycin, if you have a strain with inducible clindamycin resistance positive, then you need to change the clindamycin to resistant, even though it appears to be sensitive. So these are HUNET rules that change the interpretation. These are official CLSI recommendations. What I would like to do here is to also put in the intrinsic rules. I showed you that from the CLSI website. What I would like to do in HUNET is HUNET does use these rules for the alerts. I already showed you HUNET does use these rules for the alerts, but it does not change the interpretation. And I do want to offer that to the user as an option for data clinical reporting purposes. If it's intrinsically supposed to be resistant, I want to tell the doctor resistant just to protect against very major errors. Don't tell the doctor sensitive when it's really resistant. So these intrinsic resistance tables will help us to do that. So in a future version of HUNET, not August, that's because we've got a lot to do, but in the fall, September, October, you will see another option here for intrinsic resistance rules. And then you will see another option in data entry for clinical reporting and in data analysis for turning the intrinsic resistance rules on and off. So this would allow to do what your expectation was, you thought that HUNET would change it to resistant. HUNET doesn't because that is not a CLSI recommendation. However, a lot of people do it anyway because they're trying to protect patient safety. There are many labs that do change it to resistant precisely for the reasons that I mentioned. It's not a CLSI recommendation, 
but a lot of people do it anyway. HUNA doesn't, but it could, and we'll put that in in the next few months. Next question. Uh, I, I, as long as we're on the screen, I do want to take advantage to re-emphasize the value of paying attention to these rows and columns. So summary, you know, a lot of things, your national, uh, national responsibilities, a lot of these I do by lab so that you can do the benchmarking. Uh, I so let's summary, I can do organism by lab. Uh, I can do anything by lab or I can do it by, uh, I can do it by organism and lab by specimen date, by month or by year. So I do encourage you to be creative about how you define your rows and your columns. Instead of thinking about precisely what HUNET can and cannot do, think of a table that somebody has asked you for. Think of an analysis that would be interesting for you. By being creative with these rows and the columns, you can usually do you know, the, all the combinations that you might think of, at least the normal combinations. We're going to make some changes here. Right now, HUNET does this by specimen type. That's great, but the problem with specimen types is they get too detailed. Like blood and urine is great, and sputum and stool are great, but HUNET also has bile, pleural fluid, joint fluid. Uh, you know, there's just too many. So sometime in the next few months, we are going to have a new option. In addition to specimen type, we will have something called specimen category. So we'll have respiratory, genital, urinary, you know, because I did show you, and I did show you, let me go back to the um, quick analysis and let me show you the sample statistics. And let me go back to that real data file, which is right here. Let me go to begin analysis. Uh, this is one, this is lab by month. Sex by lab, age group by lab, location by lab, location type by lab. And here's the specimen type by lab, which I went over as a useful thing. But here you see cervix, ears, eyes, joint fluid, nail, pericardial fluid. The numbers get very small. Prostatic fluid. If I click on number of isolates here at the top, I have the valuable ones at the top. Steer, ear, I don't know if ear is so valuable, but ear for me is kind of respiratory, you know, like ear infections, vagina fluid. And then at the bottom, there was one swab, one pericardial fluid, one bronchial alveolar lavage. So this is going to be, well, we will leave this, but in addition to this, we will offer category, you know, blood, urinary, respiratory, genital, which because that at the highest level, you're just interested in those broad categories. Next. 9.15, so 15 more minutes. Anybody there? Can someone please confirm the sound is working? Yeah, Gabriel, yep. Gabriel is allowed. Does this answer some of the quality issues that you're expecting to review today? Yes, uh, firm. These are the especially the quality control uh, cleaning and the specimen cleaning, the one he talked in the antibiotic resistance. Especially the alert is very important to inform clinicians at facility level and in fact, also for our epidemiological um, report. So uh, this is what we uh, really uh, need and uh, achieved. I have an idea that would be very valuable for this discussion. I'm mm -hmm. going to do an RIS summary analysis by institution. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to click on OK, because this is just the one. I only have your one lab. For you, you actually have the separate labs. But I do have multiple institutions. I'm going to go to E. coli. Well, let's start with a simpler one. Uh, let's just go to Staph aureus. Okay. The so gram positives have fewer antibiotics than the gram negatives. Um, okay. Okay. And first, let me do this overall organism by percent susceptible. Okay. Here you see that there were 90. 91 Staphylococcus aureus. Okay. So a lot of people are interested in all these early columns. 
but from the perspective of quality of testing, not quality of data, but quality of testing, I, I want to remember there were 91 isolates of Staph aureus, but let me go to the right. And now I see my denominators. They tested azithromycin 36 times, sufoxidin 71 times, chloramphenicol four times, Cipro 64, Clinda 75. I'm really not that happy with this because it's all over the map. Actually, let me do this as a graph. Let me go back and redo this, but instead of the summary, let me show you the graph. And so let me go to number tested. So here I can see you have a lot of results for penicillin, oxycillin, sufoxidin, clindamycin, cipro, and SXT, which are moxazole. It's a lot, but it's not even consistent. You know, you test more clinda than you do cipro. Um, so what I would like to see going forward eventually is people test like they pick six drugs and they test those six drugs all of the time. Okay. Um, good. So that's one comment. I'm not, I'm happy that you have six drugs with a lot of data, but even those six drugs with a lot of data, you have about 70 suboxidins, but you only have like 40, you only have like 55 penicillins. It's better to pick a certain core minimal list and focus on that. Genomycin is valid and there's a lot of that. Tobramycin is valid. So the other thing I'm looking at, is it valid or not? And here we have vancomycin. The vancomycin disc test is not a valid test. If this is vancomycin MIC, and I can tell from the graph, let me just look at the, I mean, uh, not the graph, the table. So vancomycin disc, so that is not a valid test. So they should not be testing the vancomycin disc, at least if you're in the United States, because we just immediately go to MIC. We just do MIC testing. Of course, if MIC testing, this is another reason why people do invalid tests is they'd like to do things the recommended way that CLSI mm -hmm. recommends, but they don't have the resources to do e-test or MIC on everything. So there are a number of labs that do vancomycin dish testing. They know it's an invalid test. Uh, and as long as it's sensitive, they, don't, they assume it's sensitive. If it's resistant, then that's when they would want to follow up and do an MIC test. Um, so sometimes people do invalid tests because they know what they are supposed to do, but they don't have the resources to do what they're supposed to do. You know, e-test is an expensive thing. I will not do e-test routinely. It's just too expensive. If I have an MIC machine, you know, we do MIC testing routinely, so it's not an issue. But if we find a vancomycin resistant strain, we retest it first on the machine as an MIC, and then we also do it as an e-test as a special MIC. So that's another reason why sometimes do invalid tests. They know what they're supposed to do, but they just can't. Okay. Um, so uh, like John, can ahead. I have a question? John? Yes. Can I have a question? Yes, of course, yes. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, is there any me I mean, mechanism that we can know any emerging uh, pathogen uh, that has a public uh, health emergency threat uh, uh, during uh, cleaning of data? Is there any mechanism that we can know that any emerging species is coming up that, has, uh, that will have a public health emergency importance? Okay, so let's see. Um, let me finish the screen and then I'll come back to that okay. question. So okay. I also mentioned earlier the idea of about Ethiopia, Ethiopia, all laboratories. I also mentioned the concept of doing a minimal list. And as you can see here, they test a little bit of Tobra, a little bit of daptomycin, a little bit of nitrofurantoin for the urines, a little bit of chloramphenicol. And as you can see, they do take a lot of space. And if I'm having a minimalist, I would just, I, I would not, you know, there's certain things, there's just not a lot of data. Like daptomycin, my guess is sometimes it's only one laboratory, they only do it for confirmation. So I would have Ethiopia, all hospitals, all antibiotics, mm. so I could do everything. But if I'm doing my annual report, my annual report, I don't put everything in my annual report, I just put the most important drugs. So that'd be one use of a minimal national configuration. I would exclude the daptomycin. Um, chloramphenicol, it might be valuable for other organisms. I don't know if I delete it because other organisms, it might be common. But the daptomycin, I would just go ahead and delete it from the minimal list because there's just not enough data. Okay, so that's a comment about that. Um, okay, I'm coming back. Anything else on this screen? Okay, first of all, on this screen, you see the nice graph of what they're testing. So basically, there's six drugs that they usually test. The genomycin, the azithromycin, the erythromycin, the tetracycline are tested about half the time. 
Um, and the question is, did they change practices? Like sometimes at the beginning of the project, they do things the historical way. Later in the project, they standardize it. They try to go to a, a more official standard list. Or sometimes they have first line testing, second line testing. So if it's resistant, the problem if they're doing second line testing is the second line drugs are gonna have an inbuilt bias. If you only test the amicacin or the imipenem on multi-resistant strains, you will get reliable results that are not representative. You know, if I only tested imipenem five times, I'm happy to see my five results, but those five results do not represent all E. coli. So yes, there was a comment. I, I guess I have a question for you, is why do we only have genomycin half the time? Do you test it half the time, or did you not test it in the first half of the year, but you did test it in the second half of the year? So why why do we only have half of the staph aureus have those four drugs, genomycin, azithromycin, erythro, and tetracycline? Maybe it will be lack of antibiotics. Sometimes there's a shortage of supplies. I think that's what I suspect. But uh, yes. uh, I am sure this is exactly better. What I know is every time there is a shortage of antibiotics, so they used what is available in the lab. And it's nice to know what the reason is, because the reason you just said does not introduce a bias. They wanted to test it, but they couldn't. So the data are still rep the data are not 100% complete, but they are representative. So if the reason we only have genomycin half the time is mm. because they ran out of disks, then the percent resistance is still reliable because it, there's no bias because of missing disks. Mm. On the other hand, if they only test genomycin on multi-resistant ICU patients, mm. then we have a bias. So the mm. reason is valuable with regard to understanding. Does that make sense? If the reason yes. you didn't test it is you, did, is you ran out of disks, there's not a bias there, it's just randomly distributed. But if the reason you tested it was because it was an ICU patient or a resistant isolate, you know, from the first line testing, that introduces a bias. Yes. So you always want to understand why is this so rare? Or sometimes it's a typing mistake. Like you see E. coli with penicillin, it's just usually mm. a typing mistake. That's also mm. data cleaning. Mm. I did this overall for the country. Now what I will do is I will go back to analysis type and I will do this by institution. I'll say, okay, begin analysis. Oh, and I didn't mean to do that. Uh, you see, it just gets too busy. So uh, let me just redo that as the summary, just so it's easier to talk about. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with what I did, but this, this is a lot simpler because I'm, I'm not interested in the RAS statistics. I'm really just interested in the denominators. So here you see, oh, I didn't, did I do it? Where's my institution? I must have, yeah, I, I, did, I thought I clicked on it, but I didn't. Institution, okay, begin analysis. So now you'll see one row for each institution. And let me put this in, I'm gonna copy this over to Excel. Do I still have Excel open? Yes, I do. You see the percent sensitive? Don't care, mm. I, I don't care about that right now. I only care about the, my denominators. And I can delete this, I can delete the staph aureus because I know it's all staph aureus. So here, what, what time is it? I'm just checking the time, five minutes. Um, okay, uh, let me do this because I think it's important. Uh, max tested. So you see that AB, you see that hospital ABT had 40 isolates of Staph aureus? Mm -hmm. But they only tested azithromycin 15 times. They only tested Seposhidin 30 times. They only tested chloramphenicol once. There's mm -hmm. a variable in Excel called max equals max mm. of this. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna remove the word number, replace by blank, Oops, replace all. And I'm just making the columns narrower. These are all my denominators. <laughs> it's a little bit too narrow. Uh, let, me, let me move the, let me just put like five characters. Okay, uh, max. Do you see how the maximum, the, so that hospital 12 has 12 staph aureus and they tested clindamycin 12 times. They tested oxycillin 12 times. They always tested certain drugs. ABT has 40 staph aureus, but the most they had was 34 chloramphenicols. 
So this max is valuable, so they don't always test. So equals this divided by this, and let me paste that, oops, I have to copy. Let me paste that, and let me just put this here as a percentage with one decimal point, oh, zero decimal points. So here, 100% tested, but this one, they only tested 85% of the isolates because you don't always test. Sometimes you test it because you run out of all the disks. Sometimes if the patient had step four is five times already, you don't have to test it again. Or if it's a, if it's an E. coli in the urine, I'm sorry, if it's an E. coli in the urine with a low colony count, sometimes you do not do susceptibility testing. Or if it's a wound, people don't always susceptibility test wounds. So there are good reasons why you don't test. Like here, they had four step aureus, but the only susceptibility tested three of them. So this number tells me that most of them, they, they have it, they test it, 100% testing. This one only does 85% testing, and you might want to ask them, well, why did you not test it? And usually they have a good reason. Well, the reason might be we ran out of disks, all disks. But so, so that's about completeness of testing. And let me let me repeat, let me copy this over. Okay. And I'm going to do a new formula here. Equals one divided by 12. I'm doing this in a special way using dollar signs. Um, I want to call them C to stay the same. Okay. I'm going to copy this all the way across. I need to see my headings. Okay. Copy, paste, and let me just reformat that as a nice percentage with zero decimal points. And I'm going to highlight, so, okay, just as an example, I need to see my denominators. Let me just focus on, I'm going to just show you the first four drugs. Let me hide the other drugs. I'm focusing on the first four drugs. Oops, I did too many. Um, okay. So here we have, let me go to a nice example. Um, okay. well, well, good enough. Okay. So they have 12 Steph aureus. They tested azithromycin once. One out of 12 is 8%. 11 out of 12 is 92%. Uh, chloramphenicol was not tested, so that's 0%. Cipro, so do you understand this? Where basically is how completely was the antibiotic tested? So this allows me to see which drugs have good data and which drugs are missing data. There's actually a nice thing called conditional formatting. Highlight cells greater than 90%. And highlight that in green. So for I am happy that every, so look how green column foxes. So I am happy that all the hospitals are doing a pretty good job at that, except SMH is only half the time. Um, Zithromycin, ARH is testing it always, OHC. So we were seeing here 100% tested, whereas it's this one only tested 50%. I went through quickly with mechanics, but I'm trying to, I'm hoping you see the value of this. This allows you with a short number of steps that we could repeat more slowly on the next call, allows you to get a better sense of the different test practices in the different hospitals. And you could even minimize this further. Let me, um, let me. I want to wrap this up obviously because of the time, um, but let me just, I only did this, did you show you the four columns? Let me, oh, this is easy. All I have to do is conditional formatting, highlight cells greater than 90%, change that to 90%, green. Um, oh, it was some, I just made some small mistake. And uh, conditional formatting, highlight greater than 90%, and let's highlight in green because green is good. Okay. So here, I'm going to say I don't like is it what, what basically chloramphenicol almost nobody tests that erythromycin it's a great drug I'm so disappointed that it's only 50 percent 60 percent I'm hiding that linezolid genomycin nitrofurantoin penicillin I'm trying to things that are consistently tested across all hospitals 
And this is about the, so I'm very happy with cefoxetine and oxacillin, but even there, some of the hospitals, it's only 60%. So this is allowing me to come up with a minimal set of the antibiotics that are most tested around the network. What I would like to do is two things. I would like to get the hospital to comply with this list. And this list should be bigger. Erythromycin should be here. And this is the idea of creating a list of minimal testing that you can then score them on. I don't want to score them on daptomycin. If they're not testing daptomycin, if they are testing daptomycin, I'm happy. If they're not testing daptomycin, there's no expectation that they should be. So I'd like to say that for these, for example, six drugs, we're going to give them a score. This hospital does great. This, uh, this hospital is perfect. Well, of course, there's only one isolate. That's a different issue. But this hospital always tests all of these drugs. This hospital tests all of the drugs except for oxacillin, which is, in fact, correct. You're not supposed to be testing oxacillin except as a proxy for cefoxidine. Um, so I'll just leave it at that because we are over. But are there any questions about what I just presented? I'm happy to repeat exactly what I just did on the next call because I do think it's very valuable now that we're moving to discussing not only national planning but facility feedback. We want to provide facilities feedback on probable errors, but we also want to provide the facility feedback on which antibiotics they should and shouldn't be testing. If disk availability is an issue, this is evidence for that. And then you can use that to try to come up with a national strategy you know, for coming up with the disk, mass purchases, plan ahead of time, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, yeah, we're a little past our time. Uh, I don't know if they have, if the Ethiopia team has any questions. Uh, I don't, uh, we can cover on the next call, but I don't remember what Gebrady's question was. I did not get to his final question. I just want to make sure we record it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question was, uh, during data cleaning, is there any mechanism or any way that we can detect emerging pathogens uh, that have uh, public health relevance, public health emergency relevance? I will answer that quickly because it's so closely related to what we just did. I'm clicking on ICID alerts, ICID alerts, options. Yeah. You saw yeah. how I did this. I only asked for the quality control before. Yeah. Now I don't want the quality control. I want yes. at the national level, maybe only the high priority. Yes. Or high and medium priority. That's up to you. I will do high, high priority. What's, I only want the high priority. Yes. So now I'm going to do this and I'm going to say, OK. and I'm going to do begin analysis. Uh, oh, okay. And as a, and that was only Staph aureus. Let me change this to all organisms. That's why the list was so short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everything here has a high priority alert, mm -hmm. and the high priority alerts are mostly meripenem, you know, the imipenem resistance or the ertapenem resistance. So mm -hmm. all of these, by the WHONET definition are high priority alerts. In fact, every one of the, the last three, mm -hmm. last three we did discuss in a previous call are vancomycin intermediate or vancomycin resistant staff. So in this mm -hmm. database, this is pretty clear. The CRE, which is probably true, at least many of them or most of them, I hope it's true. Well, I, I, from a data quality perspective, I hope this is the, true. From the patient perspective, I hope it's false because it's a lot of resistance. Um, and the vancomycin is probably just a laboratory mistake. So there is an overlap between high priority and quality control issues. You always have to wonder, is it one or is it the other? So this is the answer to your question. Yes, just go mm -hmm. ahead and just uh, you know just use this feature called ICID alerts. Either ask for important species and or important resistance and or quality control. This is a summary. 22 of them was carbapenem resistance. Two were van and then two of them relate, three of them related to the vancomycin. The WHONET list is a list I give to you. I go to modify lab. Here's the list of alerts. All of the lists we all the alerts we talked about are on the list here, like the Klebsiella sensitive to ampicillin. But you can make your own alerts if you would like. That's usually not needed at the beginning, but the more confident you feel, the better you can make your own alerts, and then we can cover how to do that. But I'll just leave that for another time. 